Shabbat Shalom. My name is Noel. This is the Unexpected Cosmology or the Diaspora of Yasharel. And there's some learning curves I'm trying to get through tonight. We're trying out some, uh, some I don't know if you call it software. We're trying out uh, some new equipment and I'm on camera, of course. And uh, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Uh, I was going to go over tonight some more information from the 7,000 year timeline, but Kind of at the last minute, I, I started stumbling upon some more information. I'm like, ah, I need to I need to wait on this. I need to develop this a little bit more before I present it. So tonight we're going to be going over, as advertised, uh, something called the Hyperborea Flood. and uh, Or it's called the Hyperborea Flood and the Flood of Enosh. This is an extension of a presentation I gave last spring called the Genesis Reset. And it, in a nutshell, this is where I'm trying to... Uh, show that the Genesis 1 events, uh, Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 1-2, was a recreation event, that there were any number of creations before that, and this was a uh, what we would call a reset, and that there was um, any number of floods that Yahuwah know, destroyed the world time and time again through a flood uh, until he didn't, uh, when in fact he started destroying it through fire. And we've seen those as well, the melted cities. So with that, this is... Uh, the Hyperborea Flood and the Flood of Enosh. It's on page 20 of this document, if, uh, if everyone has turned there. And let's get right to it. Very few people seem to realize that there are actually two separate flood accounts recorded within the Genesis timeline. And I can't blame them. The mention is so brief in Yashar, that would be Jasher, that it managed to slip, slip right on by me through several consecutive reads. Well, here it is. This comes from Jasher chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. And every man made his Elohim, and they bowed down to them. And the sons of men forsook Yahuwah all the days of Enosh and his children. And the anger of Yahuwah was kindled on account of their works and abominations, which they did in the earth. And Yahuwah caused the waters of the river Gihon to overwhelm them. And he destroyed and consumed them. And he destroyed the third part of the earth. And notwithstanding this, the sons of men did not turn from their evil ways, and their hands were yet extended to do evil in the sight of Yahuwah. Jasher 2, 5 through 6. Which this is perfect, because we were just re I was reading this as a, a family for a scripture portion this morning. The account happens very early on the timetable. Enosh was the grandson of Adam, so he's the third in line, and Hava through Seth. And anyways, we're only in the second chapter of Yasher. Noah's flood doesn't happen until chapter 6. Details seem slim, but we are given far more than most might appreciate. Firstly, the floodwaters originated with the Gihon. That's one of the four rivers flowing from Eden. Secondly, the river was capable of flooding a third of the world, telling us there were many deaths, but also a great deal of survivors. Though the anger of Yahuwah was kindled on account of mankind's rotten works as well as their abominations, the trigger point seems to be idolatry, according to this text, but also uh, the same events happen in Genesis. That lines up with everything else I've read about the flood of Enosh. Yes, there is another account. We shall turn to it in a moment because here is another little detail which most don't seem to realize concerning the idolatry. So this is going to come from the Aramaic Targum. And to Seth also was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. There he is. That was the generation in whose days they began to err and to make themselves idols and surnamed their idols by the name of the word of Yahuwah. Wow. In the days of Enosh, the idols were surnamed by the name of the word of Yahuwah. That's what it says. The sons of Cain were making idols of Yahusha. Though the recreated earth was only a mere three or 400 years young, which is precisely what the RS RCC commits themselves to today. In case you are left unaware, a mass cannot transpire unless the deed is done. And Jesus, I'll say Jesus there, is present to suffer on a crucifixion device. I have had Catholics disagree with me on the matter, only to look it up for themselves and go, oh, 
Yes, they are driving the Pope mobile over Yahushua HaMashiach repeatedly for every single mass on our motionless plane and then backing it up to do it again. There is probably not a single moment in any given day when a Catholic priest is not uh, stringing idol Messiah up on a tree. I don't say this often, but that is blasphemy. That is blasphemy right there. No, it is pure evil. The RCC has forsaken the Torah of Yahuwah in making their own covenant laws and thinking Elohim will be okay with it. But aha, they have grace, you see. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that's precisely what happened in the days of Enosh if the Targum has anything to say about it. Adam would have been the high priest and instructor in the mysteries of heaven. Seth afterwards. Meanwhile, the sons of Cain were stringing Yahusha up on a pole so that the rebellion against Yahuwah's instructions and in righteous living might continue. That's the story of humanity right there. There is nothing new under the sun. But getting back to the flood, or floods, plural. I have already shown you Enosh's flood, which is not to be confused with Noah's flood. Well, I have actually discovered what may be three separate flood events within the Genesis timeline to date. And that's not including the Great Deluge. I'm still uncertain as the actual number, whether there was, whether there was two or three. Uh, let's look at them. Look, blah, blah. <laughs> let's look at them then, shall we? Here is the third contender. Now, I'll, I might say this later. I always jump ahead of myself, but there is a reason I'm doing this. All right. Because when we look at the quote unquote flood record and we're looking at the geological columns and everything else, you know, a, a young earth creationist. And in fact, I think I do say this a little later on. A young earth creationist is going to say, no, everything is explained by Noah's flood. Okay, there, there's nothing happened beforehand, nothing happened afterwards, all those fossils, everything you see, that's all Noah's flood. And of course, I'm here to say, no, there were a bunch of floods, including the recreation of it, and you might be seeing all sorts of past civilizations in there. All right, so this comes from the Colburn Bible Book of Creation. Now, I feel like I need to quickly introduce this to you guys. I did talk about it last week in the mud fossils, and the Colburn Bible is a, it's a mysterious read. It, there hasn't been a lot of scholarly work done on it. Um, I, I want to be clear that I am not stating that this is in any way scripture, all right? This is not Holy Spirit breathe, however you define that. But this was most likely written in Egypt by priests right around the time of the Exodus, right around the time of Moshe. These priests who wrote this book, this is some phenomenal stuff. I mean, they're saying like all the Elohim on the earth are false Elohim. They all serve the most high, that there is one creator of most high. They're saying that nobody knows his name, that he has these laws, which they give these laws and they, they line up with Torah. I mean, some of them are exactly as you see in Torah. I, my theory on this so far is that the people writing this book are in the same sort of priesthood. They're not Michelle today, but they're in the same sort of priesthood as uh, we would say Jethro. I don't think I don't, I've never seen evidence that Jethro was in the Michel, Michel, Michel priesthood. He might have been, uh, but I'm kind of thinking that these were these kind of priests, and they're digging into the archives and showing history, and uh, you know it, they line up, uh, they parallel Genesis amazingly. So let's get right to it. It says Elohim passed through the spaces of the heavens above with a mighty roar and a loud trumpeting. Then came the grim, dead silence and black, red, lit twilight of doom. This is so epic. It's like I'm reading from like the Lord of the Rings or something. Great fires and smoke rose up from the ground and men gasped for air. The land was rinsed asunder and swept clean by a mighty deluge of waters. A hole opened up in the middle of the land. The waters entered and it sank beneath the seas. I call this one the Hyperborea flood because the mental image given to us has a hole being opened up in the middle of the earth by which the waters entered. In saying it sunk even beneath the seas, I'm leaning towards a whirlpool explanation for the daily high and low tides. What does that remind you of? Well, Hyperborea, if you've done your research on it, which might also connect us to the Yasher flood events, seeing as how the, the Gihon River is potentially one of the four rivers of Hyperborea at least according to the, uh, the map. You should know that the context of this flood takes place directly before the rec recreation event in Genesis. Colburn speaks about Noah's flood, but this isn't it. It can't possibly be the same flood as Enosh then, because this is, again, this is the, a flood that takes part in the recreation event leading up to the Garden of Eden. They call it Garden Land. 
very adorable. We're looking at an entirely different event. And so what else does the water sinking into the hole remind you of? It reminds me of Enoch's vision of the desolate earth after life seemed to vanish into the abyss in first Enoch eight, uh, 83, four through six. Uh, so take a mental note of that. I don't have that in this chapter, the segment. I'll flip over there, I think, when we're done so you guys can compare. I think what we just read lines up with that in Enoch, uh, theoretically, I think. Well, let's keep reading to see what happens. Then again, the tumult and clamor ceased and all was silent. In the quiet stillness, madness broke out among men. Frenzy and shouting filled the air. They fell upon one another in senseless, wanton bloodshed. Neither did they spare women or child, for they knew not what they did. They ran unseeing, dashing themselves to destruction. They fled to caves and were buried, and taking refuge in trees, they were hung. <laughs> I want to know if like the trees actually hung them. That's so provocative there. Taking refuge in trees, they were hung. Who hung them? There was rape, murder, and violence of every kind. Yeah, Josh, ints, exactly. The deluge of water swept back, and the land was purged clean. Rain beat down unceasingly, and there were great winds. The surging waters overwhelmed the land, and man, his flocks, and his gardens, and all his works ceased to exist. This is a total destruction event of the earth. And again, it's not Noah's flood. Some of the people were saved upon the mountainsides and upon the uh, float sand, but they were scattered far apart over the face of the earth. They fought for survival in the lands of uncouth people. Amid coldness, they survived in caves and sheltered places. I mean, that's really interesting right there. Um, amid coldness, they survived in caves and sheltered places. What does that sound like? This comes from the Colburn Bible, Book of Creation, Chapter 4, 11 through 13. I, I'm, I'm still fresh on reading this book. I've been just devouring it. And it's just paragraph after paragraph. This is so gripping, the whole thing. I'm thinking I was correct in, correct in calling this the Hyperborea flood event. Because look at what happens. The floodwaters enter a hole and sink beneath the ocean. When the survivors surmise that the tide has retreated, they fall upon one another in acts of rape, murder, and violence of every kind. The retreating waves give them a sense of, of victory, of, of false shalom, thereby strengthening a resolve which would have their abominations only increase in measure. It's not so far removed from the picture of declaring peace, a false peace. See, I'm always jumping ahead of myself. Before destruction befalls them. That's when the deluge of waters returns, low tide to high tide. The waters surge and overwhelm the land, destroying everything in its path, continuing. This gets really fascinating here. The land of the little people and the land of the giants and the land of the necklace ones and the land of marshes and mist, the lands of the east and west were all in, in, un, in undated. The mountain land and the lands of the south where there is gold and great beast were not covered by the waters. The Colburn Bible, Book of Creation, 4.14. Wait, <laughs> what? The giants I have heard about. But who are the little people and the necklace ones? Don't tell me. The little people are the weak folk. They are, aren't they? I knew it. Or are we dealing with the hobbit people? No, I am thinking we are dealing with the fairies this time around. The reason being is that the little people are tied up with the giants and the necklace ones, supernatural beings. The necklace ones would persist in stories much later on and are sometimes referred to as uh, bl uh, blimmies or blimey, uh, blimmies, I think if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, the, uh, I've shown that artwork before. There's actually bizarre photos from the 1800s which uh, purport to show one of them and their faces were on their chest. Uh, they were the necklace people, the headless people. And so here you see an old Egyptian text that's saying that they exist and they were destroyed in this flood. The surging tidewaters, it seems, were targeting them specifically. They're all creations of angelic beings telling us there were past incursions, even before the Enoch account. Also, they likely held blame for the abominations. And can you really envision hobbits being the cause of human woe? Me neither. Obviously, this is not the same catastrophe, uh, catastrophe event as the flood of Enosh, even if there is a potential connection to be found with the Gihon which brings us to the next flood account. So again, this is the next book over in the Colburn Bible. It's called the Book of Gleanings. And this is what it says. Thus it is written in the record of Belshira. 
In those days, the people were wicked, and though the wise men among them gave many warnings of the wrath to come, they would not listen. And, of course, we see this all going through leading up to the flood, that wise men came forward, they would warn of it, nobody was listening. Such is the way of the wicked. So it came about that the hastening spirit became stirred up against them because of the odor of wickedness arising from the earth, for her nostrils abhor the smell of evil. So here, that, that's interesting right there. You see a reference to the earth being feminine and conscious. This is a smell no man can know, for as the hounds know the smell of fear, which no man can detect, so can other beings know the smell of wickedness, and the earth can smell wickedness. The great floodgates, which are above earth, were all opened. Thus the floodwaters rose up to cover the land, and great rainstorms lashed down. The winds could no longer discover their destinations. This is the Colburn Bible Book of Gleanings, chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. Pause, because there's more to the story. Right away, the description has, this, has all the markings of Noah's flood. The great floodgates and the firmament open up. So much water is unleashed that not even the wind knows which way is north or south. It's not Noah's flood, though. I know this to be the case because the great deluge happens a little, a little later on in the book, really only a couple chapters later. What are we reading about now is what we are reading about now is only an appetizer of what's to come. It must be the flood of Enosh then, even if the, the, guy, the Gihon is not specifically mentioned as the cause of it. I won't discredit one or the other if you won't. In any ways, the event surrounding this floodgate event matches up with the description given to us in the days of Enosh. You will see what I mean soon enough. Continuing. Pausing for a drink of coffee. The great people left the plain of uh, Shinara. Does that sound familiar to you? The plain of Shinar. And fled up into a great mountain rising above the flatlands below. We were just talking about that a few weeks ago. And here near the summit, they camped. I wonder what they're going to do up there above the plains of Shinar. Feeling themselves secure, the wicked mock, saying, No water can ever reach up here, for there is not enough of it in heaven or earth. Still the waters rose even higher, and the mouths of the wicked were silenced. The priests of the people danced and chanted in vain, and many rituals were performed to appease the wrath above. There came a period of quietness. Then the people built a gateway to heaven wherein the chief of interpreters might commune with the other realm. Book of Gleanings, chapter eight, uh, chapter three, verses eight through nine. Pause again. Tell me you read what I just read. The plain of Shinar would later be mentioned in Genesis 10. But again, that is a different event, a much later repeated event. Nimrod would have attributed what he learned to his pre-deluvian forefathers. And as you can see, our speculations were correct in that it involved height, but also a Stargate device. Continuing. He, he here would be the, uh, the chief of interpreters, the, like the high priest of the children of Cain. He entered into the silence and cast his spirit. And when he had done so, it contacted the hastening spirit which men call by other names. Her voice, so this is interesting. So the, the, the Goldberg Bible makes it very clear that there is a creator Elohim that is above all other Elohim. And they never report to know his name. They don't know his name. But they say he's none of the idols. He's not, you know, anything like that. But then you also have the, the, the mother Elohim and uh, feminine, her voice, right? And almost oh, every single time they talk about the voice, it's the Ruach HaKadosh, the same equivalent. So I find this really fascinating. Her voice was heard within his heart. And it said, I am that which has been called forth by the odor of wickedness arising from the bodies of men, which no instance can disguise. For as the smell of putrefaction assails the nostrils of men, so does wickedness give forth something which assails us in this realm. Wickedness, wickedness is, therefore, an offense against us. If a man threw filth over the wall into the, your courtyard, would you not consider this an act of hostility? Could any among you live in harmony with those who were insensitive to your own sensitivity? Thus I am awakened to happenings in the world of men and am now clothed in a uh, performing substance. The spirit being said, I have no desire to unduly punish men. 
Go out to the people and tell them that if they will but mend their ways and walk no more in the path, path of wickedness, I shall depart. And this same warning is, is given in, like we see in the book of Giants, um, Enoch, different, different books where time and again, Yahuwah, the Most High is saying, look, like you just depart from your wickedness, repent, and I'll consider, uh, I'll reconsider the whole flood thing. We'll just, we'll do away with it. We'll just keep, you know, going on as we were. The spirit being is feminine and consort of the creator. She appears all throughout the Colburn books. And that is all. Continuing. But when the chief of interpreters returned to the people, he found them fearful and distraught. Clay in the hands of false priests. Devotees to the baleful gods. That's So that saying right there, all those idols. I love that line. Clay in the hands of false priests. The false priests were crying out for a sacrifice to their Elohim and had seized Annas, a young man more handsome than any other, a messenger and runner between cities. Then, though they whispered fearfully among themselves concerning the deed, the people had seized Nanua, handmaiden of Iloma, the enlightened one, whose life was dedicated to Ilana. For she had cried out curses upon their heads when the young man was taken. The Stargate was a, was a success, and the connection to the flood of Enosh is dutifully noted. It involved idols. So again, so in this book, they say the flood came. It didn't destroy the whole world, but it destroyed a lot of it because of idols. And then Jasher says the same thing. A third of the flood was destroyed because of idols. After the chief of interpreters spoke with the feminine spirit being, I will go out on a limb here and claim her to be the Ruach HaKadosh, the, definitely the equivalent, he observed the false priests forming idols out of clay. Then They then committed the deed of human sacrifice. A young man and Nanua, a handmaiden of somebody named Eloma. Eloma appears to have been a Enoch figure who was transported in much the same way, but was a woman rather than a man. She had three sons, each of whom preached unto the sons of Elohim, okay, the sons of Elohim, and warned them not to go unto the daughters of men. Well, that's fascinating. The human sacrifice was in relation to the idols. And as you will see, the RCC does the very thing whenever they conduct a mass, continuing. Before I continue, though, just to reiterate this. So assuming this account is in any way true, uh, you have a feminine prophet. Her name is uh, Iloma. She's got three sons. And they are going and warning the sons of Elohim not to take on human wives. So I don't know if they're the sons of Seth. I don't know if they're in any way related to that, that chain of events. Uh, they're definitely a part of the event, of the Watchers event. Um, and um, before and afterwards. But um, it's just interesting because when you when you're going through Genesis uh, one through six, we get um, you know I'll say like you know Adam lived for thousand nine hundred and thirty something years and then he died right, and and it's like think about all the history like those six those are just six chapters of genealogies we're not getting all the history in there and uh, that's why I look at this stuff with fascination like. I mean, just think about all the history that's happened in the last 50 to 60, 70 years and try fitting that into six chapters of Genesis. It can't be done. All right, continuing. Nanua and Annas were held by the false priests and about them surged the great mass of the people. And though the chief of interpreters raised his voice, it went unheeded. Then the mass of the people moved down to the water's edge and there they stop. So keep in mind, they're above the plains of Shinar. The water is rising up the mountain tops, but it, it hasn't. We don't know how high up the mountain it's gone. So they're moving down now to the water's edge. And there they stopped while the priest shouted prayers to the Elohim raging above. All the heavens were darkened with great rolling clouds, and there were high winds and lightning about the mountaintop. The people rent their garments. The women wailed and men struck their forearms. Annas was beaten with a club and delivered to the water. So there you have a human sacrifice right there. Then as he who wielded the club turned towards Nanua, she said to those about her, let it, let be, I will deliver myself to the waters for if I must be sacrificed, I would be a better sacrifice. So given 
Then she went down to the waters, but as her feet entered, she drew back from the cold, dark, watery depths before her. But as the one who wielded the club moved forward, a young man, uh, Shiluat the scribe, a man of quiet ways, neither handsome nor strong in body, pushed forward and taking her by the hand, went down into the waters with her. The waters had risen high and men shared the place where they stood with wild beasts and with sheep and cattle. But now the tumult quieted and the waters drew back. Seeing this, the people shouted praises to the baleful Elohim and cried out, Great are the mighty Elohim and great their holy priests, as the waters drew back. The chief of interpreters went sorrowfully apart. Why is he sorrowful? Because he knows that they're praising uh, idols. And he's spoken now to this feminine spirit being that has told them this. And he's sorrowful because he's like, should I tell them the news? Hiding himself. So he's hiding himself. For now, he was fearful for his life. When the waters had, had subsided, he cast his spirit and entered into communion with the hastening spirit. And he said, shall I also enter the falling waters as a sacrifice? For life is now futile as I am without Elohim or honor. The great one answered, Men see in events the things they wish to see. This is so good. They can interpret only according to their understanding. The waters rose to their limitation and did not fall because of the needless sacrifices. The powers above may ordain events to chasten men, but more often such events are challenges and tests. However, divine intervention is rare indeed. Book of Gleanings, chapter 3. The waters drew back after the human sacrifice, resulting in exuberant praise towards the idols, putty in the hands of false priests. Only the chief of interpreters was sorrowful, realizing now that they were directing their worship towards the wrong Elohim. Hence, the result of Enosh's flood in Yashar is conveyed. The, the floodwaters arrived because of idolatry, but the idolatry did not cease. Ironically, the people believed it was the idolatry which saved them. The feminine spirit said as much when stating men seen events, things they wish to see. The human sacrifices had nothing to do with the, the, the waters receding, but they saw it differently. There is one more passage in Colbrand which ties all of these flood accounts together, including those disaster events contained, which we have already covered in other books uh, in this Genesis reset. It falls directly behind the hyperbo hyperborea events and claims the following. This is really good. Pay attention to this. The earth is not for the pleasure of man, but as a place of instruction for his soul. A man more readily feels the stirrings of his spirit in the face of disaster than in the lap of luxury. The tuition of the soul is a long and arduous course of instruction and training. Elihim is good, and from good evil cannot come. He is perfect, and perfection cannot produce imperfection. Only the limited understanding of man sees imperfection in that which is perfect for its perf purpose. This grievous affliction of man was another of his great tests. He failed, uh, man failed, not Elohim, man failed, and in doing so, uh, in so doing, followed the paths of unnatural Elohim of his making. Man makes Elohim by naming them, but where is this, where in, th in this is the benefit to him? Book of Creation, chapter 4. Only the person with a limited understanding would cast his gaze upon the world and conclude that it was imperfectly made. In telling us that Elohim is good, we are reminded of the creation week and that each individual day was declared the same. The same person will likely devise that the earth should be designed for, the, for his pleasure rather than the instruction of his soul. If so, then he has failed the test and the very reason by which he has arrived here on the earth, below the firmament, to learn of heavenly truth and conform to the image of his heavenly father. Therefore, disasters may have always been intended in the good of Elohim's design so as to stir man towards his higher calling. But that's not what happened. Uh, certainly not for the wide path of humanity. The lesson learned apparently is that idols are the pathway to salvation. All right, so that's going to conclude the um, my portion, my expansion on the uh, the Genesis reset. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed that. Um, I really like that information in there. And like I said, I 
yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to wait on that. I'm going to wait on the 7,000 year timeline deception because there's more I want to put in there. I keep finding more and more passages that, you know, give this understanding that there were, uh, uh, 6,000 years of history have already passed. The Messiah arrived in the year 5,500, and that the millennial kingdom naturally happened 500 years later, and it's already passed. Uh, we'll save that for another night. 